Greetings to all our listeners and welcome to today's episode of What's Doing, where we explore the depths of the Malaysian creative arts, television and the film industry. I'm your host, Abid, and today we have an exceptional guest who plays a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of Malaysian cinema. We are honored to have Datu Kamil Othman, the newly appointed chairman of the National Film Development Corporation Malaysia, FINAS. Datu Kamil is no stranger to the creative industry. With a rich history of leadership within FINAS and as a creative industry advisor to the communications and multimedia ministry, his insights and experiences are invaluable in understanding the dynamics of the Malaysian film industry. Today, we are set to delve into the pressing issues, the exciting prospects, and the intricate workings of the Malaysian film fraternity under his guidance. We will also touch upon the critical aspects of nurturing young filmmakers and the realities of achieving international acclaim so ambitiously targeted in the Road to Oscars mission. So without further ado, let's welcome Dato Kamil Othman on to What's Doing. Thank you, Dato, for, for this honor, for coming on to the show. And uh, my first question from you is going to be as the new uh, chairman of FINAS, what is the vision for you for the industry? Well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, show. It's been a pleasure. And of course, the, your first question gets straight to the point. The vision is really to see a new Malaysian cinema to arise from all the wonderful things that have been done in the past to sort of collate, sum them up and try and use them for the benefit of a new Malaysian cinema that will not only be catering for local consumption, but also for exports. That's great. So in your previous roles with, within Finas, you know, and the creative industry advisor, uh, what were some, some of the key challenges that you faced and, you know, and how did those experiences shape your current position as a chairman? Well, we could say that the, the issues are primarily revolving around uh, what we call the Malaysian government commitment to the industry by putting in grants and other support, infrastructural support, in order to let the industry move on. However, uh, what's missing along the way was the fact that uh, the idea to create entrepreneurs within this industry somehow was not looked at properly. And I'm not uh, saying that in the negative way. All I'm saying is that uh, when there is uh, a lot of support, uh, you find it hard to distinguish between those who are in it for the entrepreneurial part, meaning to make money out of the products, and those who are there because simply because the support exists. And this is, has been our main challenge because um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have to separate the film industry from the other non-film industry. If you're talking about the film industry, there is this thing called wajib tayang. Sijil wajib tayang simply means that any film done in this country must be shown by the theaters. Compared to other countries where it's not a matter of wajib tayang, it's a matter of whether your film is good or not. It's worthy enough to... Yes, it's worthy enough to be shown. So in some ways, uh, okay, I'm, I'm generalizing things a bit. I mean, uh, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, but what we have seen happening is that the emphasis to make sure that a particular product, a particular film product, to actually take off uh, is not as, uh, how shall we say, is not as maximized as it should be. Because the satisfaction is the KPI, so to speak, is just that I've made the film and it gets shown. Now, whether after that it goes beyond our shores is uh, something that doesn't drive. You know, because uh, when I was with MDEC, I have seen entrepreneurs, young animation companies, young ICT companies, apps companies, who were there from the very beginning because of their obsession with their product and services. And that drives them into a sort of a entrepreneurial, despite having government support. So it pushed, they, they yes, pushed, it pushed it, them. Yeah. 
So it's a typical story of the SME model, you know, starting from seed financing, and we are taking them all the way to IPO. Unfortunately, for the film industry, that's not quite the picture we have yet. And uh, we are not blaming anyone, except that I think what has happened is that the subsidy uh, situation has created a different kind of uh, people that come into the industry. Remember, with ICT and animation, the people who enter the industry are those who are actually, who want to be in it. And who are animators and who knows who the technology. Who are animators and who are technologists and who are ICT, who are just simply what we call uh, ICT nerds, right? They know the job. Dana, yes, and all inspired by the likes of Steve Jobs and, uh, you know, Bill Gates and whoever. And, uh, you know, it's all about invention. It's all about innovation. It's all about getting into the world. And they don't have just Malaysia as their market. In their heads, it's about something that will change the world, change the landscape. Now, you don't find that in the film industry, mostly because of what I have just said earlier. It's a support system that needs to be relooked to see that the support is similar to the support given to the animators, the ICT and the apps developers and the games developers as well. well that's coming out also big uh, in mm -hmm. that part. So, so how do you plan to address the ongoing concerns and issues within the Malaysian film fraternity? Uh, especially regarding transparency and accountability? Right now, actually, if you look at the year 2023, if you notice, this is our best year for Malaysian cinema yet. Yes. Because we have got many, many films that are right now carrying the Malaysian flag in the many festivals around the world. Uh, and as you, as you know, recently, there's a film called Abang Ade that backed a lot of nominations in Golden Horse, you know, prestigious events like this. And uh, Tiger Stripes, yep. you know, won the Grand Prix at the uh, Cannes Film Festival. And I can name a few more. Rain Town being exposed, uh, you know, to the world right now in a way that uh, we've got a Malay director directing a Cantonese movie, uh, which is part of that move towards Malaysiana that I'm hoping that we would reach to eventually. Uh, Stone Turtle, many other films, yeah, and short films um, as well. So the talent is there. So that much we don't argue. Now, the paradox or the challenge that we have right now is this. These are small films, small in the sense that the budgets are manageable. And most of the time, the help that came from the public sector is only in terms of seeding. It's all about giving small money for development. And then they themselves, because they are very much into their projects, uh, the initiatives are all taken independently. So I must admit that Finas cannot claim 100% for all these successes, but we did provide the seeding or the environment. Now comes the next question. What about the other cluster? Because technically speaking, filmmaking in Malaysia is divided actually between two uh, clusters for one of a better description. One is what we call the one who makes films in order to make money. Yeah. So this is the model that Hollywood is based on, Bollywood is based on. Studio model. Studio model, right. So the whole idea is make films, create film stars, create action, create whatever to break in the box office. Now, although that is the intention, the fact still remains that our previous hope that a film that can make it big in their country of origin can also make it big outside the country of origin has not been met. So what have we done? We are looking now at the marketing aspects. Are we poor at marketing our products? That's one question, right? Yep. Uh, to hype, up, hype things up? Yes. Or we are not using social media in the way that it should be used? So that is the what I call the positive factors that we are considering. The other side that we're also considering is that are our stories not well developed such that uh, we are only creating films for ourselves, for the local market, yeah. which makes it difficult to go beyond Malaysia. I mean, um, 
Singapore, Brunei, and other traditional places that our films could go to. But Indonesia, we still have problems breaking into Indonesia. So the solution that you were alluding to earlier uh, could be now, as we are planning it, co-production. Because what we are seeing is that more and more films these days are made not by one country. They are normally the end result of a few countries getting into the picture. Now, getting into the whole production environment is not about creative intervention. Some of them are pure investors. They're just investing in order to get something back. Uh, but there are also some who comes in from the creative side. So whichever way you look at it, it is up to the producers to actually manage how the film is made and how the film is to be financed. And this is where we come up with the other, perhaps the other uh, shortcoming in Malaysia, that of the global producer. We only have a handful. Yep. You see, like, uh, how did that cover girl could get the kind of traction it gets? That's because you must have a producer that is aware about all the possible angles uh, that uh, could actually leverage on the product, whether it's OTT or theatrical or whatever, you need that producer. That's what we are lacking at this moment. I think it's, it's the global vision is missing. At you're saying that mm. from, the, from where it's conceptualized, to the marketing, to the release. I think uh, what producers need to think from my perspective is that when they are starting production, they need to think that is they are ma- going to make it for a global audience. That's right. Rather than just a local market or the local audience. Absolutely. So I think from if, and if that's the same thing which we had for That Cover Girl when we were, we were writing it or when we were developing the, the story, that how a Malaysian story can travel across the world. That's right. And I think that is what uh, means in my two cents is that uh, when when uh, producers are thinking of new stories to tell, that should be the approach where they have to think from a global perspective. Absolutely. If we take uh, that cover girl as an example, the film is really about it has to do with something which is very Malaysian, the hijab and the the class that that new class of. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, you know, it's all, it's all about business really, but it is also about the family unit. And really we're talking about the upper middle class kind of thing. Now that has been covered endlessly in dramas that you watch on RTM, Media Prima, plenty. But they didn't move beyond the this norm- show. Yeah, yeah. For the reasons that we mentioned that something has to be made fashionable and um, you know, with the world audience in mind. So it's fair enough. I mean, I'm not uh, saying anything negative about the local dramas and all that. I know RTM and Media Prima and Astro has come up with some good dramas. Yes, some great stuff. They've got great stuff. And I think in their hearts, they are also willing to sort of push this out uh, beyond the domestic shores. But somehow, uh, it's still not happening in the manner that, that we are hoping. Basically, it's something like this. BBC can export their shows. And as you know, even something like The the Bridge was also adapted for the Asian market. So basically, what we are saying is that there's this whole new forces behind the market for content. The demand for content and, uh, is you know, it, it's filled with all sorts of possibilities right now. And we come again to the producer, as you rightly mentioned. So the producer is the one who needs to keep an eye on all this. Uh, because even you look at some of the territorial sort of distribution uh, agreements, right? I mean, we saw uh, Roma first on Netflix, yeah. yeah. But in UK and Europe, it was on the cinemas. So that sh- shows you the variations and all that, and which needs a new breed of producers. That's why, amongst other things, Finas is trying to uh, inculcate that uh, breed of new producers. No, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That I think the new breed of producers, they are started. You know, they have started thinking in that perspective. That's good and, to know. Yes, and I think we are on the right path, as yes. I see from. And whether this is something that even the universities and the institutions of higher learning can take on board, uh, what Finas is trying to do right now, and you will see more of this in 2024, we are going to select the award winners the people who have gone through thick and thin to get their films to New York, Barcelona, Busan, wherever, 
and they will be the mentors in terms of masterclasses and knowledge sharing yeah. with our local filmmakers. So that uh, we hope that that new way of looking at There's things, knowledge sharing, yes, and knowledge sharing can be shared. And amongst the uh, participants, we hope there'll be more of similar, um, you know, similar types of, um, well, uh, producers that can emerge. Definitely. That brings me to the next question, which I think is the same lines. Where like, what is Finas uh, doing to nurture and support young and emerging filmmakers in Malaysia? Right now, it's through the grant system, which is through uh, what we call the first-time filmmaker. The yeah. DKD one. Yes, the DKD, uh, Dana Kandungan Digital, where we have uh, a sector called FAME, which is actually first-time. Uh, the first-time is still being reviewed now, so that we can make it maybe second-time also. <laughs> but really, the crux of it is that the first-time filmmakers, we always encourage them to do short films. Because it is from short films that you have, that you attain all the discipline you need to go into a production of a longer feature film or a documentary. And so, also, it's a good good space where you can you can actually check whether they are serious filmmakers. That's or right. Yes. So that's one first time filmmakers, or maybe second time now. Um, but we try to say, go for short films first. One because there are a lot of short film festivals around the world now where actually real big studios are actually there to mine for talent. They would go there and they say, you know, this is the type of, uh, you know, the uh, flavor or the ambience that they like. And also the ambition. The ambition, correct. Then secondly, we also have the development fund for script writing because the script at the end of the day, the screenplay is the foundation of all one good film. So I think for 2024, we're going to spend more time on developing uh, scripts and screenplays. And that may be through a lab system where the script can be mentored. And uh, we will take out that element of rushing out. Rush here means normally we would give a time period, six months, seven months. But I think creatives need a little bit more time. But it's not just, let's say, 12 months with nothing. It is 12 months that we fill in with, let's say, a script being sent to Busan or Berlinau for them to be looked at. Uh, because that's the only way to ensure a universal quality. Uh, because I would assume that most of the time when we write, uh, we still can't help it. We are still thinking like a Malaysian. Very insular. That's right, very insular. So it needs a Korean or a German or a French to have a look at your script or screenplay, and then provide their inputs on it. And also, I believe that like what has happened with some of our independent films, it is this process that allows you to network with other bigger players that can then give you access to funds, which previously you... You're not aware of. That's right. So I hope this is the way that, 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 that we can proceed. No, that, that's a great idea, because again, the more you're going to talk from people outside, uh, Malaysia, mm -hmm. the more you'll have ideas and you know uh, ways to to get your movies funded or yes. you know get all the kind of support yeah, you that's need. That's right. Just like uh, just like I think uh, your you your producer will probably be called uh, for one of these knowledge sharing sessions as well to share the journey uh, because uh, I know a little bit of the background about that cover girl. You know, like it began uh, uh, like a. It was a labor of love, yes. and regardless of all hurdles. But finally, it's all a case of uh, you've got to have it made. And then that's when the uh, you know, prime all came onto the picture. And uh, that's a good model because I think in many parts of the world, that's exactly what's happening. Except that in Malaysia, because of the support system, and that's why there is, doesn't seem for some to be the need for that. Because it's all about producing something, yeah. and it's and broadcasted, it a, yeah. and that's it. No, that's that's a valid point, actually. So, the uh, moving on to the the next question is that the Auditor General's report, you know, highlighted some concerns about government funding and grants for filmmaking. Uh, what measures are being implemented to ensure effective uh, use and distribution of these resources? 
Right now, uh, yes, we know the grants has been a constant source of concern for many people, and Finas has been accused of many things as well. So, uh, as what we are trying to do now is that we say let's accept the criticisms, uh, you know, like uh, head on, yeah, head on, like gentlemen or gentlewomen, and let's see what could have caused it and whether it has a real basis or not. Now, here we have to see the points that I've mentioned, some of the points I mentioned earlier. If you have a system like before where, let's say, only production grants are given, what it does is that it opens doors to someone, anyone, to just want to make a film, but without looking at how prepared he or she is. So, uh, and most of the time, at that first level of evaluation, before even the film is made, someone would already have a script or a screenplay done, a few key resources in the production that they have actually spoken to, and then the grant is given, assuming that they already have funds to carry on. Remember, Finas is not a financier, it's just a support, right? Yeah. Now, what has happened is that we know that most companies are using finances funds as a financing tool. In other words, they don't have any money in their bank account. Yeah. And whatever Finas provides, that is the actual budget and the money to be spent. Now, this is where the problem is. It diverts the functionality. Finas is only there because you want to make a film for one million. You only have 400,000, and you come to see Finas for 600,000. So we do checks on the bank account and all that. So most of the time, it seems to be okay. But the reality is that most productions appear to have problems at the end of the milestone period. Because as, as you know, grants are given on the milestone basis. You complete one thing first, and then milestone one is ended, you get the, other one. the balance. Yeah. I think upon signing, it's 20%, and then it goes on and on and on. Most actually have problems during number three and number four before it becomes a complete film. I don't know how they have uh, managed uh, not to manage the funds. Because post-production, marketing, and That's all, right. that part all of that is part and parcel of it. And uh, the system now looks at production as a production only but with uh, marketing and all that out of it at this moment because it is supposed to come in at the end of the line. So grants are being segmented. So one of the things that we are trying to do now, uh, and also based on the Auditor's General Report, is to minimize this by actually saying things on an end-to-end. -end. That's why, uh, no, easier said than done, but that's why it should begin with a script that Finas has nurtured from the very beginning. We have to somehow green lane it into the production mode and then take care of it, not holding hands really, but just to make sure that it transits from one segment to the other and including the marketing and a &P. Uh, And this is where the grants have to be allocated in such a way that maybe green laning is the best option because you are taking care of a child that you actually have uh, nurtured, schooled, and uh, which brings to mind also the other skill that is badly needed for the industry here, and that is the role of the production accountant, payroll accountant. Any Western films, or even from Japan, India, you would see a payroll accountant or an accountant. Right now, you and I know when Finas gives out the grants, we just give out the grants and there's no audit even. So maybe we are talking to reintroduce that element in. I think that's a great, uh, it's a great uh, initiative. Actually, FEMI, part of Finas, does that. I Means so while we yes. are making the show, correct. So they have the independent uh, auditors which audit the production, mm -hmm. and they do a fantastic job. Yes, because we have done it, we know that. Correct. And I think if that gets introduced, the same similar model which already exists. Uh, into the, the grant bit of it, uh, then I think there's a lot more accountability and there's a lot more transparency. Indeed. That FIMI model is based on the fact that you spend first yeah. and then we will audit. Now, that actually gives us a clue as 
one of the options that we can consider for the grant system. Yep. It's a bit like um, the way that accountability comes in is when the producer is using their own money first. But with the assurance that when the film is done They'll get it back. and is audited, that you have actually spent X amount, you are going to get 30% back. So FEMI provides that model. Uh, we can't transplant it wholesale, but we could actually have elements about it. Example, I have actually suggested uh, maybe uh, we do not give out grants, but it's actually what we call soft loans. But that loan is converted to a grant once your film is completed. I mean... It's a safe thing because yes. then, then you have Correct. you know uh, a motive to finish Correct. a product. That's right. Uh, it's not been confirmed yet, but uh, this is one of the suggestions because we had a management uh, board retreat uh, two weeks back, and this was one of the items that we discussed. And the other items that we discussed, again, uh, related to the Auditor's General Report, is what we call the first money and the last money concept. First money is actually for first-time filmmakers. Those who have just graduated and all that. So first money, it's okay. It's only for short films, independent films. And most of the time, it could probably revolve around screenplay writing and for their screenplays to be sent to labs uh, because there's always a lab in Yogyakarta, in uh, Japan. There are always places like that. And again, it's not so much Finas. It's the producer who's producing it. They should know about all this. The script doctors. The script doctors, that's yeah. right. So that's one part. The last money is for those established companies who are coming in regularly to ask for funds. Only when they have accumulated maybe 60% of the actual funding for the movie, they come to finance for the balance of the 40. So that's the last money concept. In other words, we will look that you already have uh, funders. And also a track record. A track record. Or maybe you can even have a minimum guarantee for, uh, you know, like there's a broadcaster behind you, there's a distributor behind you, or you go to Cannes or ATF in Singapore and you already met someone who's willing to invest or to even uh, co distribute, uh, co-produce co your film. Yeah. All that facts in, then the balance, the stop gap, we will try to accommodate. That's a good idea. That's a, that's a brilliant idea, actually. I mean, that gives a lot of accountability for, for the product to be finished and to be done. That's right. So, um, in terms of, uh, you know, infrastructure and policy, um, what improvements are necessary for the Malaysian film industry to compete globally? Good question and a tough one as well. So far right now, we are exploring and observing the rate of films that are taken up by international film festivals to see what's the quality or what kind of essence that they have. Here. Is it the action type or is it something else? And of course, you and I know the world actually loves human interest themes. Things that they can relate to and without having to worry about any uh, wondrous uh, escapades into fantasy land or, uh, how shall we say it, uh, elements of, uh, you know, superiority in any, uh, you know, army action movie or yeah. whatever. So we notice that human interest. Now, if you look at all the recent spate of successes that we have, including Tiger Stripes, Abang Ade, Stone Turtle, and even Rain Town for that matter, it's all about human interest. It's about family, and it's about something that even somebody in Santiago in Chile can relate to. So maybe that's where part of the answer is. And I think to make the film global, we still have to accommodate the the big budget um, nationalistic kind of films. But again, that's for last money purposes. Yeah. Uh, but for the first, at least for the first money, we have to focus on that sort of film. The one with human interest, the one that shows Malaysia in a different light or in a perspective which uh, the world can relate to. Now, again, this brings to mind that uh, since imagination has no limits, really, uh, there might be a lot of things that uh, you know, the film community can come up with. So in that sense, uh, we still have to look out for sensitivities and stuff like that. I think the three R's, I think, the three R's that we are supposed to avoid, we can avoid. But having said that, 
although many creative people have said that uh, they would like to make a lot of films, but they couldn't because of restrictions, I would like to say that one of the greatest things about creativity is that you can circumvent these things. There are a lot you, of ways to yes, skin the cat. Skin the cat. You can tell the same story, but in another form. Now, for those uh, filmmakers who are, you know, like gung ho and wants to tell it as it is, I always tell them that yes, 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 but that is not creativity. That is emotional creativity. Of course, you like to say everything that you like to say, but remember, some of the best novels in the world, some of the best films in the world. Some of the best music in the world are all actually messages in a bottle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, for want of a better word, right? Very subtle messages, but those who know will know. Reading between the lines. That's right. And this is where we could perhaps come to another aspect that Finas is looking at right now, uh, which is the audience themselves. Talking about making product, producing films is one thing. But I think we also have a lot to do about audience appreciation. Uh, a, a very good example. I mean, you see some, a film like Oppenheimer. Uh, you could say that uh, the majority of people that I know saw Oppenheimer as a longish, boring little film. But we have another group of friends in, across the causeway, and they loved it. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, when I talk, I'm talking about two almost similar groups here, in, in the sense that education level is the same. Uh, they are sort of uh, of a certain stature, but most that I know in Malaysia said it was longish and boring. And then uh, there's on the other side of the causeway. Not that I'm support, you know, sort of glorifying them, but they saw the thing. And then we ask ourselves: Is this something to do with the education system? that allows you to accept a person's biography in a very uh, sort of... Um, Non-entertaining yes, way. Yeah, Non-entertaining way, but still getting the uh, story across. So that's why everyone who comes for uh, proposals on biography in Finas today, we always ask them, do you want to do an Oppenheimer? Do you want to do a Gandhi? Or do you want to do a Elton John's Rocketman? Because all three are significant perspectives on biography, or even Elvis, the most mm -hmm. recent film. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's how we are trying to assess and trying to articulate the way by which uh, we can convince both the audience and the uh, filmmakers themselves. As for the audience, we are going to ramp up our exposure of Malaysians to international films, not necessarily new ones. But maybe the classic, uh, as you and I know, I mean, uh, like Citizen Kane, I mean, it's almost compulsory for any film student. First movie in a film school. That's right. And then at the same time, uh, even Hitchcock Psycho will be shown as an example. And that's just the West, but you have Japanese, Tokyo Story, Yasujiro Ozo, and Malaysia. We can show some of the films of Pierre Ramli even. Panare Becha, for instance. Is a classic example of a guy who was doing comedies, comedies, comedies. And yet, when he had the chance, two films by him, Jeritan Batin Ku and Penari Becha, becomes something else. It is telling people that there is a class gap. Yeah. There is this thing between the rich and the poor. But most of all, it's about the Malays. So, uh, and you can see that in that sense, Pierre Ramli is a genius when it comes to making films. Abdul, the three, Tiga Abdul, is actually the three, to me personally, are the three components of what makes a Malay a Malay. So it's really a message to the Orang Melayu, yeah. which we should understand. But I suppose uh, at the same time, it's not just Melayu. I mean, uh, Hong Kong filmmakers have been making films about to say the Chinese, this is what you are. Europeans have been doing it for ages. Even now, Napoleon gives him right. right. Say what you like. Emma Bachman was trying to rip open the psyche of the, uh, what do you call it? The Scandinavian <laughs> mentality, yeah. but basically European. The French have been doing it for ages. And in America, although Hollywood doesn't do it, but you know, the small personal films are all about that. So that's how it should be, I believe, that we should be going into that area where audience should appreciate all this 
and not watch something like No Country for Old Men and come back and say, ah, boring film. <laughs> Right? That's, a, yeah. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Yes. Yeah. Although it was a great... Uh, so uh, it will be done through what we call film appreciation uh, screening. Okay. Uh, which will be held either at Finas premises or we would probably take a theatre somewhere. But mainly we are trying to work closely with the universities, institutions of higher learning. That would be great. Actually, you know, uh, like what Project Room does in Singapore... Mm-hmm. They they release all these old ones, That's right. and you get a full house for 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 those kind of movies. That's right. There are people who want to watch that That's right. oldies, and you know, taking the second generation out for a movie which they might have seen in their in their childhood just to connect. With the movie. Yeah, absolutely right. That's why uh, we have already spoken to the French embassy, Latin American, just to get the idea that they could bring in the kind of classic films from their respective countries. Even including Britain, um, there are some classic films uh, which the message we're trying to say was that they were made at a time when even censorship was strict during that time for them. And yet, um, uh, Fellini could have made La Dolce Vita yeah. and tell, tell it as it is, but without showing too much. Yeah, Hitchcock in Psycho, it was a Slasher movie, yeah. but you hardly see the knife going into flesh and all that. It's all about technique. Just the blood draining down That's the right. water tub. And which brings to mind the other new thing that we're going to look at next year uh, in terms of training, music scoring. No, no. Because uh, most Malaysian films, we notice uh, to cut costs, they use stock footage. I mean, stock, stock uh, music. music. Yeah. Uh, we would rather people actually do the scoring. Like in Abang Ade, it was very good. They did their own scoring theme song, and I think more, uh, more and more are doing that. Yeah. Uh, so we hope that can happen as well. And maybe if I could just add, we would also like to add the other element of advertising and promotion. We've got to create a new breed of uh, sales agents. Yeah. Uh, because we notice in more and more productions in the West, they already have sales agents with them from the very beginning. Yes. Even for you know uh, for awards entering. Maybe entering into any of the awards, I um, mean, uh, you have these uh, uh, agents who will send all your entries That's to right. all the awards. Exactly. You don't have to do it per, I mean, so, uh, one by one, but yes. they will do it for the whole, uh, you know, for the whole year, and all Correct. all the film festivals can be sent. That's right. That's why we are talking to the distributors here. We are trying to encourage them to become international sales agents, so that when they get any producer getting the Finas DKD. From the very beginning, they could already have an international sales person with them because they could guide them. Even from a script perspective, I think once the script is ready, I think they can go in and, and shop for, for co-production. Right. Which brings to mind also another new change in the Finas marketing strategy. Uh, we are not just going for film festivals next year. We are going for events where there's a film festival and there's also a film market, content market. And the idea is uh, not only to market Malaysian film, completed films, but also work in progress. Scripts, as you were yes, saying earlier. Yeah. Uh, who knows, you could find people who could invest and also to get slots for pitching. I was in Busan recently. There were 12 young Malaysians who were there pitching at the platform Busan. And I said, hey, you know, I mean, how come you're there? I mean, we didn't even finance, didn't know you're here. Oh, we no longer would like to, we didn't want to disturb Finas because we know Finas is for the big boys. And I said, big boys? No, I'm, we are now looking, redefining the word big now. So the good thing was uh, we engage uh, with them. And now I think Finas will open its doors as it should do to the in the independent film community as well. Fantastic. That's great news. That, oh, that's really, really good. Even we are, I, mean, I was in ATF in Singapore uh, last week and in the pitching session, there were a few Malaysians. Nations, yes. yeah, and that, that really uh, you know, surprised me also. And I was very happy that they're taking the initiative and going and pitching in front of you know right. a lot of people. And uh, we will monitor them. And uh, well, basically we are saying, uh, Finas, we are opening our doors now. Uh, the only thing is that, and this is personal, uh, I'm not sure whether it will go down well with some, but this is called um, creative advisory. Yes. 
Well, it is because yes. you know, uh, and a first-time filmmaker is already lost. Basically, he's trying to figure out the money's perspective. I mean, money problems he's facing. He's an independent filmmaker. Uh, how to produce it? How to direct it? How to do the post-production? That's so right. The last thing on his mind is going to be to you know take it to the fest. Uh, uh, that's this. right. Yeah. So I think that kind of support will definitely help. Right. Uh, new filmmakers. Right. The creative advisory support that I was talking is uh, there's one more angle to it, and that is actually to look at the film itself or the script and try to do some changes. Okay, that's just from a personal angle. You know why? Because I have made it a point over the last few months to watch a lot of local films. Most of them are what I call missed opportunities. They could have been great films. But somehow, for some reason, the director or maybe the screenwriter didn't push it into the right places or they didn't press the right buttons. Or push the envelope right. in the first place. So it's all missed opportunities. The acting was already good. Performers were already excellent. Technically, the DOP knows how to compose the scenes. And even music, well, maybe music for some of them. Uh, they already done the scoring, which is good. But somehow the thing didn't work because they could be what I believe to be trying to make compromises in order to achieve commercial viability. And, and towards the end, it's just yeah, rushing it. And that's right. Towards the end, it's a rushing towards, uh, you know, a film become just bland. So I do not know to what extent we can interfere because in a way it is creative, uh, creative interference, but maybe uh, we can uh, classify it as advisory or maybe I would like, for instance, for a team in Finas to look at the final cut before it's even released. Just look at the final cut and make adjustments there because our purpose is not actually to interfere in the real sense the process. The process. We just want to make the film to be accessible also to outside Malaysia. So we could, for instance, uh, bring someone from the French embassy <laughs> yeah. to be in the final print to say, yeah, monsieur, if this is to be released in France, do you think you know, it, will work. Uh, it will work? And uh, the way that we make films nowadays, because it's digital, there's all this footage that you put put aside, and who knows? Uh, some films may even benefit with the end being the beginning and most on, with a little bit of dialogue changes and with a bit of character development. I mean, everybody saw Martin Scorsese's Killer of the Flower Moon, and although it's three hours long, almost like a Hindi... Three and film, a half. <laughs> three and a half. You know, even like a, you know, a film from Chennai yes. is almost that, that long. But then people realize, oh, what he has done is he has developed the characters in such a way that, uh, number one, the audience understand where the characters are going into. And what is the cultural sensitivity? Cultural sensitivity is involved in it. And right. what's the history behind it? That's right. No difference from what Hindi uh, Bobby and Sangam was doing. Three hours long, you get to know the characters. Remember Bobby? Yeah. Hati, yeah. Mary Sati? Yes. So it's all about that alignment. So once the audience gets involved, you forget it's Robert De Niro, but it's that character. Uh, it's and then day. you can hold them for three yeah, and a half right. hours. You hold them and trial for, and trial, you know, for next three hours. And you suddenly worry about the characters. You're, you're, you're emotionally invested. That's right. So <laughs> maybe that's where we could do it because most of Malaysian movies tend to still go for what I call the sanitized subjects. But that very sanitized subject can be made a little bit more adventurous. With adventurous, more, not risque. Right, that's right. Not, not, not risque, but adventurous and maybe a different angle of taking it. Okay, let, let's take a very small example. Uh, if you look at, if you watch Abang Ade, if you notice most of the camera work is on medium and medium close-ups and close-ups. For that, you need very good actors. Yes. They are scared of close-ups. Right. And yet, some of the terrible films that I've seen, for some reason, they prefer long shots. 
But when the performance are not really of that stature, you would find all the faults and <laughs> through that that long shot uh, scenes, right? So, so you, can, uh, you can pick all all, all the you know, that's flaws. Right, yeah. So this is why I mean I I know that I'm not a filmmaker myself, but I always say that uh, I'm the one buying the ticket, so I have the right to say whether I like a particular film or not. You know, because yes. uh, I buy the ticket. And uh, I chose the films that I see. And if I like something, I would like to share why I like it. But I have no problem somebody else not liking it, telling me why he or she doesn't like it. I think this whole film thing is not a kiasso thing. It's like uh, I have seen films that you haven't seen, and you have seen films that I haven't seen. I would love to know some. Yeah, but that, that, that's the exchange, knowledge exchange. And you that's know, right. You know? And that's why I expect even producers here and directors here and screenwriters here to be also in the same mode. Because that's what I notice in other countries. Anyone who directs a film is like a film maniac. He understands, you know, the language and everything. And the producer is also another, I mean, a producer as in a line producer, they are also obsess about films themselves. The only one who are not... Uh, like that are the investors. <laughs> they just want their money they back. They just want their yeah. money back and, you know, the waterfall, uh, you know, they get paid first before everybody drips down to everybody else. That makes me go to the next question, you know. Like, can you shed light on this whole road to Oscars, you know, mission which which Vinas is working on at the moment and what realistic strategies are put into place uh, to achieve this ambitious goal? Right. Well, firstly, Road to Oscars was a project that was uh, initiated before my time. So when we came in, we saw Road to Oscar. We said, yes, it is a very noble uh, ambition. Uh, and exactly what I've been talking earlier are all sort of uh, working. We are shaping things up so that we could move towards the Oscar. But not the Oscar. Oscar is like the ultimate AB. I mean, it's just a name, more like a symbolic thing. But along the way, uh, we have to have uh, big or small jackpots along the way. And in some ways, we have already achieved that. So, I mean, Tiger Stripes, for instance, yes. I mean, one button press, critics price in Cannes, yep. which is no joke. I mean, how many films could actually get that far? Uh, Abang Ade, seven nominations. Uh, I think, no, sorry, I think more than seven nominations at the Golden Horse Taipei, where there are 500 entries. That's quite prestigious, right? actually. And then uh, Singapore Film Festival. Uh, we had relations, uh, I think, getting some awards there too, as well as the project. There were some relations that have pitch and project. So, in some ways, we are already heading there. The only thing right now is uh, we have to look at the policies that can be sustained. Because one of the issues with Malaysia, if uh, I can share, is that sometimes when governments change or when the heads of departments change, policies change. And once that happens, sometimes it interrupts that flow that you're that supposed vision. to, that, that vision. So what I would say is that not everything should be maintained. Uh, but even if those things that need to be maintained or fine-tuned, let it run on its own court. And the road to Oscar is actually one of those things uh, that whatever we are doing now, it should be maintained. I mean, like, uh, what is our challenge now? After a good year for films this year, what about next year? I mean, we need to think now about 20, 2024, 2025. Uh, will there be another Tiger Stripes or that will win the Grand Prix? at uh, Cannes or even at Barcelona or at Venice. So the calendar has to be made for the, yes, for the next three years, right. you know? So that is why uh, we are really focusing on the grants that are to be given out uh, now for the development of screenplays that are poised or that are actually in a good position to become the films we just talked about. It doesn't matter whether it's a festival film or not. Okay, they can still have a release in Malaysia. But like I said, we are looking at two sides, right? The blockbusters will still be there. Because that the, we have the to cater. Yes, that's, we have to cater for the uh, 
uh, audience here yeah, and to keep the sort of the flag flying. But at the same time, the flag should also be flown outside Malaysia. And uh, this is where perhaps, okay, Malbat. I mean, Malbat is something that makes Malaysia proud and Air Force and all that. Yes, we need that, that kind of films. Uh, but we also need the other kind of film. We need the Abang Adeks of the world, the, uh, my tiger, I mean, the Tiger Stripes of the world, Rain Town type of film to spread it out. So in that way, we have to find that balance. And I'm not saying it's, e it's easy, but I think through our uh, management of the funds, I think we could actually get uh, a lot of things sorted out, especially co-productions now. What we have learned from films like Tiger Stripes is that, like we were saying earlier, uh, no man is an island kind of thing. Uh, Tiger Stripes, I think, was funded by six, seven countries, and including our neighbor, Singapore, also puts money in it, Indonesia, Qatar, other than France, Germany, and, and the Netherlands. Uh, I think Abang Adi began life as a project uh, that went through, I think, uh, in Taipei. And later, when they wanted to do the production, they got funding from Taipei as well. Although, at the end of the day, for Malaysia, they got FIMI. So you see, everything is working in some sort of a synchronized way. So we have to study that a bit more in order to see where the next pathways should be. But we have to be fair to both sides. One are they the Hollywood, Bollywood type of blockbuster, the tearjerker, which Malaysians actually love, the Mat Yep. Uh, type of films. And the other is the small film, or what I call small comparatively. True. Uh, that takes me to the next question, you know. You know how does Finas plan to balance commercial success with uh, you know artistic integrity uh, in Malaysian cinema? It's uh, going to be very difficult because at the end of the day, it's all about what's on the screenplay does not necessarily translate everything you know with accuracy when it comes to being a film. Uh, but we do it this way. Uh, we look at the themes, the stories that uh, we are dealing with. Normally, when it comes to all these big budget productions, the one on patriotism, the commercial, it is actually decided by the, the big, uh, what I call the big chiefs, yeah. And that would include the likes of Astro Shaw, right? I mean, they've got their own slate of productions, and normally they make films that are of uh, nationalistic, patriotic nature, uh, or just commercial. And if they get an award anywhere, it's a bonus. And I think Scope is doing this very well too. All this, uh, what some soul is doing, is all about big commercial. Um, but at the same time, you also have the other uh, category, which includes animation, which are now creating a lot of interest around the world. Jared, for instance, the horologist, uh, with Khans, and uh, there's a, a film called, uh, animated film called Pillars of Strength, which also won awards uh, in a lot of places. So uh, these are the, the two that, that we have to look at. So basically right now, it's more or less like we say, last money is for the big boys and the first money for the new boys. Uh, and I think along the way, even the new boys will become the big boy. I mean, if, if you look at the uh, industry references, uh, some of the best directors came from commercials, for instance. Yeah. So it's okay. I mean, they can apply their trade in the commercial world. And then uh, that can prepare them for the, uh, you know, the kind of films they're going to make later. And that's why we're also emphasizing on documentary, because documentary films give normally the filmmaker and the team a sense of discipline. Because you have, well, like commercials, you have to say within, what, 60 seconds what you need to say. So that will give you the discipline that you need and the economies of scale. You've got to work within a fixed time period. And then, of course, we have the other part where you got to, you know, documentaries, where it has to be specific on a subject. So I find that people who come from this kind of background are not necessarily the director. It could be the second unit, first unit, assistant director. When they enter the film industry proper, they know what it takes to make a film. What we would like to avoid 
are people who just wake up one morning and say, I want to be a filmmaker just because there are grants. That is... Let's try something new. That's why. <laughs> yeah, because uh, there are people, there are situations like that. I mean, if, if you see some film, I sometimes wonder if the filmmakers uh, watch them, they could actually come out and honestly tell me that they've made a good film. And remember, film criticism here or film reviews here are sometimes not honest too because it's a friend, you know, amongst friends. You can't say too many negative things. But in actual fact, the very word criticism simply means it's supposed to be constructive. You uh, could do better than what you've right. done. So it doesn't matter if a news, I mean, if, if, if a news portal rip your movie apart. Your reaction shouldn't be emotional. Maybe even meet the guy and say why. I mean, that's why sometimes I would like to be met by some filmmakers uh, to just uh, be asked the question, oh, why are you not happy with my film? Because all these are inputs. Remember, it's a lifelong learning thing. There's no such thing as a great filmmaker and then you stop there. Yeah. Even the masters, you can talk to anything. You read the biography of Kurosawa or Fellini. It's all about learning. They go to a new country, Pasolini. He went to India for a holiday and he went back to Rome and did uh, the next film. Had uh, not only the Italian flavor, but a very mystical Indian environment as well. This is what it's all about. And uh, we have to create that community of filmmakers. And right now, I believe that the grant system may not have uh, made it uh, easy because some producers are in it only because they are grants. And I don't think that uh, this should be you know, held on for too long because what they should realize is that they can actually make money from making good films. And the solution to that is that make it saleable outside Malaysia. Yeah. Yes, one million euro box office is different from one million ringgit here. True. And the whole idea is that when you get that sort of sum of money, you're supposed to reinvest. That's how the industry is yes. moving. Reinvestment, like any other business. In short, maybe it's because of my involvement in MDEC before, where we brought up uh, new startup companies all the way to IPO, that we understand that it's actually that mechanism, that very same path should apply. Except we have to distinguish between the business part of the industry and the creative part. Yeah. So in some ways, Finas is dealing mainly with the creative part. But we also have to bring the business part in because at the end of the day, I think that is the one that is impeding our good films, our good talent from actually going outside. This shows. What role do international collaborations play in the growth of the Malaysian film industry and how is FINAS facilitating these partnerships? Yes, we do. We are, are in fact going more for co-production uh, initiatives and support. Um, the way it works is like this. It could be a Malaysian screenplay. The director is uh, Malaysian, but the cameraman, the DOP could be a Singaporean. Actor could be from Indonesia, and that's how it works. And you have seen this working already to some extent. Uh, most of the Mandarin-speaking films are actually a combination of, let's take Taiwan example. Uh, yes, post-production is done in Taiwan, for example, yep. uh, or in Thailand, for that matter. Why? Because when the Thais put in the money, uh, part of the uh, quid pro quo, is to have something done in their own country. Yeah. Uh, the film Tiger Stripes had uh, a director of photography who's from France. That's how the French contributed to the film. And I think Belgium and the Netherlands did contribute. And uh, what they do is that under this quid pro quo basis, you actually allow that interaction to happen. And this is why the labs are important to me. Because at the screenplay stage, I'm talking about the lab, not so much for the production, but for the screenplay. Because the lab would have been nurtured or mentored in an environment where already there is a universality aspect to it. We're not talking about a technical part yet. This is a story. So the story is being shaped. So by the time it gets into production, it is easy to now 
go to the country where one of the mentors is from, let's say Philippines, and say, since you've been involved in this, could we put in, you know, some uh, funding in or even in kind? And I think that's the way to go. And uh, right now we have got about half a dozen projects which are like this, uh, where FINAS is only required to do only a small portion, which is actually to say something like this. Country of origin is Malaysia. So the screenplay is most likely and uh, most logically to be funded by Malaysia first. Yeah. So it could be a small sum, 50,000, 100,000 ringgit for the screenplay to be adopted and for it to be uh, what I call go to a lab. Then the next stage production, we can come in either as last money because there would be countries. There again, what is needed for this sort of initiatives to move into what you've just asked, is the producer again. The director is about the creative part. He should be thinking, not be thinking about whether they can assemble the funds from Thailand, Cambodia, or wherever. That's the producer's job. And what is the other producer's job? Marketing. While the film is being made, whether it already has agents in Cambodia, Vietnam, if you're thinking about Asia, and of course, Europe. And Finas's job, we bring them to the events like Cannes. Yeah. And make them meet these people. So uh, Finas normally... Uh, Becomes the facilita yes, facilitator. We normally facilitate and pre-arrange the meetings. So Malaysian companies will come with us, hopefully. Well, it is happening, but we will sort of expand it up. Malaysian companies who follow us to Busan or to Hong Kong, Tilamat, uh, most of the meetings are already pre-arranged. For example, I'm right now looking at two projects who are asking for a budget which Finas cannot fulfill. Because remember, they come in initially thinking that Finas can take care of the full spend budget. We said, no, we are the last money. So if that's the case, they say, where's the first money is going to come from? Then we say, there's a slot that we can arrange for you in Hong Kong in February next year. Hong Kong Philomat. Yeah, yeah. There's a section that I call HAF, H-A-F, which is the financing side of things. We could get them a slot. So right now I have to make sure that they're ready with the investors back because really they are meeting the investors. Okay. Because our motto is that who says you can make a, a hundred million ringgit film? Who says you, ca you can't? You can. But it's all not going to come from That's us. That's right. But it's not all going to come from Finas. But if you have a good producer who could actually go and pitch for these things, uh, it's fine. Uh, so the other area that Finas is looking into right now is to facilitate and to assist by having more training on what an investor spec should look like. This is especially for producers. So it ties in with that producer's uh, workshop, that training. It's not about the director. That's the creative part. It's about the producers. When you meet Finas for pitching or RTM, that is the Malaysian style. They are used to that. But once I put them with, in an environment with the European investors and with the Japanese investors, it's a different ball game altogether. And I think only a few have escaped from that unscathed. Majority got burned because they're not prepared. Now, this is what I'm trying to say. You are only prepared for what I call a localized environment, localized pitching. But just like animation, what you were doing at MDEC, you want to make an animated series? What do you think are the typical <laughs> questions, right? Who's your target audience? Now, if somebody says, uh, you know, young kids. kids, we say boys or girls. Then if you say, oh, can be both. What age? Because all this plays a very important part in the marketing and in the way that you shape the content you're going to produce. You tell me it's preteens. Okay, preteens. You tell me which area of the preteens? Asian preteens? Uh, European? American? Uh, okay, I mean, I'm not saying that I am an expert, but this is what producers normally go. And this is what investors would normally ask because it's all about return on investment for them. So uh, 
that is the discipline that we have to put in in order to get to what you were saying just now to compete internationally. Because competition internationally is fairly smooth if already your one of your actors is Indonesia, example. Yourself, Christine Hakim, just like Bron Palare, everybody knows him. So put him in. So uh, why does that cover girl can be, you know, go to so many countries around the world? That's because of the story is universal. But if you had put in, let's say, if you're not making it as a TV, as a, as a you know, like an OTT, uh, you know, series, but if it is actually a film, all you need is to have Korea's most handsomest <laughs> K-pop singer in there. There you have it. Straight away, celebrity. Straight away, goes. celebrity, yes. So this is why Finas is going to emphasize on this producer, this new group of producers. The current crop of producers are okay, but I think they need a little bit of beefing up too in order to see beyond 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 borders. Beyond borders, yes. So Dado, in your opinion, you know, what are the key factors that will define the future of Malaysian cinema? I would say the new breed of producers, which is what we are working on, to create more producers that can think in terms of whatever content they are producing is intended for the world. Two, to channel the government grants into what we call developmental areas. Uh, developmental here means it could be anything from a screenplay, someone who could uh, develop a script from a story or a script from an adaptation. Because remember, uh, in the West, almost 90, 95% of all films or TV series are based on books. Uh, Malaysia is one of those few countries where we still want to go original and uh, having problems trying to decide where to, you know, how to be original. Uh, this could be a problem for some. So we would go for that kind of screenwriting in a very sort of customized form. Screenwriting uh, based on adaptation, screenwriting for documentary, or maybe the genres. We will try to go to screenwriting on horror film and all that. Uh, these are all what we call transitory, uh, so that after we have created it, maybe in a few years' time, we do not worry about things like that anymore. But here I'm going straight to the point of what are the shortcomings of what we notice as the shortcomings in the films that we see today. Point number three will be the quality of the performers, the acting. I think that needs to be beefed up as well because other than just a handful, we only have a handful of uh, very good performers in the Lawrence or anyway <laughs> sense of the word or even for P. Ramli, you know, even on some of the songs. But I think most people nowadays, uh, even the performers, I think they are having delusions that they are already uh, Oscar winning uh, you know, material. So, so they got to work on it uh, because it's all about, how shall we say it, experience, right? Building up the experience. So their performance, those are in front of the camera. Fourth is the behind the scenes, what we call the below line. You've got to go into skills, especially skill sets. Now, if you look at a typical uh, film today, uh, most of the areas that need further fine-tuning will be cinematography. And for that, we are already working with MySC, which is the Malaysian Society uh, for training and courses. And also in the what we call production design. That's wardrobe. very important. Yes, That's production important. design, uh, wardrobe design, costume. Styling. Styling, and of course, the hair and makeup. Uh, and uh, the other is the music uh, scoring side. So these are the five or six key elements we are looking at uh, because these are the ones that we see lacking. Then uh, the next uh, will be the audience appreciation. Keep them exposed and uh, we hope even the local broadcasters could assist us in screening, uh, you know, films, classic films. Like, uh, it doesn't matter, from US, uh, 
Japan, Asia, Koreans, or even from Malaysia itself. Uh, they have made good films. And Mahdi Murad, Dr. Mahdi, has made some very good films. Uh, recently at Finas, we showed a film by Manso Kute called Saman, uh, which almost has a cult status in the sense that everybody has been asking. Who was that it? one? Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it. So I think every new generation can come along and enjoy films like those. Right now, we are preparing for a film by the late Dr. Anwar Nor Arai uh, called uh, Johnny Beacon Film. It's a five hour film. Wow. Uh, which uh, are on DVDs at this moment. So, and some of the DVDs are not playable anymore. <laughs> so I am working together with uh, Hassan Mutalib to get this thing off the ground. So inshallah, I think we'll be able to have a cut. Uh, again, while we're talking about all these films from the past, restoration and archiving is also one of Afinas's uh, main agenda. Uh, because you know, in 2013, Film Negara Malaysia was merged into Finas. So that means we've got archives in our midst, uh, films from 1947 thereabouts, and uh, this is where we are also focusing our attention on and hoping that uh, more and more Malaysian filmmakers can start making films from the past and using these archival footages. It's quite common in the West, actually. Yeah, I think that will really help the new, new, new generation of filmmakers to you know, That's put right. in stuff which was done before. And, and uh, talking about that, we also believe in technology partnership. I was going to come to yes. that question, actually. Right. That uh, how is Finas basically uh, bringing in the whole virtual reality, AI? Uh, well, uh, technology is foremost on our minds as well because we know that although we lovingly and affectionately use the word film, we know it's not really film the way that a celluloid or nitrate-based uh, film is uh, these days, right? We are still talking about film in the general sense of the word. So yes, technology. Uh, first and foremost, the technology that we are working on is on the restoration and archiving, and also to make it accessible to the public. Uh, we would like to be a bit like Getty Images, where anything to do with Malaya uh, and Malaysia uh, are within our vaults. Uh, we have to restore and digitize. And there are still tons of films to be digitized. About to be basically to be restored first and then scan and digitize. And once it's digitized, it will be made available. And I think even on Facebook now, we still have YouTube. And yeah. on YouTube, uh, we have some of the uh, older archival materials there. So that's one part of the technology. The other part is we have also accepted that Finas is not actually technology centric. So what we should be doing now is to have more partnerships with technology partners. That is to make ourselves future proof. Yeah. So we do have studios and plans for virtual production and all that. But really, I mean, uh, we feel that this is where the partnerships can come in. Now, partnerships bring in itself a certain sensitivity as if we are going to be friend, too friendly with certain parties who would supply us the equipment. Actually, we shouldn't be looking at it that point of view. We are getting advice from those who know these things best. And the decisions will be made later. Because I find what has happened with uh, some of the facilities at Finas is we have invested millions into facilities only to find out obsolescence comes in uh, within a short period of yeah, time. Yeah, the technology moves That's very right. fast. Yeah. Correct. And even at AMDEC, we notice that very much too. So to avoid all this, we need that partnership with uh, technology partners. And who they might be, well, I mean, they could be with Panavision. Technicolor, you know, and all these big uh, companies. Uh, also, the uh, with the Australian uh, archive. I mean, we, uh, the Australian Institute of Ar Archiving. Uh, we are looking at our own core competence, and I think I believe that the average uh, Finas uh, technical site is much better off spent in other things. Uh, let's say, like in the road to Oscar kind of thing, the technical thing, rather than to worry about technology. Buying new stuff buying and you know, which stuff. gets obsolete really fast. That's right. So that brings it to the last question, and this is a very important question, by the way. Yeah. Now that we have, you know, uh, Tansri Michel Yo, 
I mean, it's gone ahead and, and made such a great name for our country here. And what do you think will be, you know, the future uh, Tan Sri Michel Yeoh? Who will be that one? Or do you see that uh, that that uh, actors and actresses have started looking in that direction that, that one day they will be taking the world stage, holding an Oscar in their hand? Or, you know, uh, there's a lot of time. I mean, is, is there... Uh, is it just a pipe dream or is it going to happen? We were very happy that Anshi Michel Yeoh got the Oscar because um, it brings to mind the what we call nothing is impossible. So a Malaysian has done it. But to be fair, we can't claim 100% that she got the Oscar because of us. Uh, because she did it on her own. She's got her own journey. But that fact aside, she is still a Malaysian and she has gone on record to always remind the world that she's Malaysian. So in that sense, is uh, what we are saying is uh, we will find the opportunity whereby we will call Tan Sri Michelle to say that you achieve what you have achieved with, I think, only minimal support, I think, uh, from, from the country. So now let's make sure other potential Michel Yeohs will not go through the same thing. So I would love to sit down with her and to discuss that journey, that very same experiential journey that she took to be where she is today could easily be sort of uh, used as the basis to shape up some of our policies. That's number one. Number two, with Tan Sri, we will also tell her with all your network, could some of the things we have been discussing earlier be put into practice? You mentioned earlier about we discussed co-production, co-financing. Now, most importantly, Tansri Michel would probably have a lot of contacts in the distribution field. And all she has to do is appear in a cameo role in one of our, the next uh, Malbat or Pascal. And that's it. That could be the entry point to Hollywood for a big budget uh, movie. I'm sure Adrian Tay will be very happy <laughs> to hear that. Cameo, five minutes, walking around. And we might even try to convince uh, Harry Golding to walk yeah. in for another you know, three seconds. Or James Wan, for that matter, to give a master class on uh, horror, on the horror genre. Uh, what, who else? I mean, we've got Defunt Norman, whose films Wow was shown in Singapore. Uh, he's based in LA. So, uh, who? Chai Meng Liang, Taiwan, Hong Kong, plenty, I think. So, and, and in China, I was in China and I met a lot of Malaysian filmmakers there. Well, maybe this is high time to bring all these expatriates back, or even if they have a better future or a better career elsewhere, but you could still come here and we would leverage on you for your contacts and for your. Uh, for the insights. And something for yes. the industry here. That's right. And certainly for Tan Sri Michelle, yes, uh, I've mentioned, made many, many uh, sort of uh, intimations, right? In Malay, we call it uh, Marise. <laughs> <laughs> to try and get her to, uh, the next time she comes back here, to Ipoh. We can, we're matter, really looking forward to that yeah, one. To just get her onto, you know, maybe just like, like I said, a cameo role. You know? That brings us to the end of the show. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. It was an honor to have you on the show and hope whatever we have discussed today, uh, we'll see the day of, uh, light of the day and uh, hopefully our industry is going to be uh, up there with the rest of, you know, amazing other Hollywoods and Bollywoods. And so uh, thank you once again for coming. Right. Thank you very much for giving me the privilege, uh, the honor of being on your podcast. And uh, it's good to be able to share some of the things we are doing so that um, we make it clear. It's, it's, it's transparent time now. Uh, we are even publishing the names of those who are getting grants now so that uh, the public will know that it's not just we are trying to hide things, uh, things up. And the only thing right now is that maybe we'll also publish the names of the person who are evaluating because most of the time those who, who were not successful in their uh, uh, applications 
I would blame it entirely on Finas, but we said, no, 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 ladies and gentlemen, there is a steam group of highly learned individuals who are actually in the evaluation panel. So sometimes, uh, that really opinion. it's not Finas uh, who are doing the evaluating, but it's this group. I think that 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 uh, brings up that whole transparency thing which we were talking before. So thank you, Dado. Thank you so much for coming. Today's conversation underscores the importance of nurturing talent, fostering innovation, and embracing the challenges in the journey towards international recognition. Under the guidance of visionaries like Dato Kamil Othman, the Malaysian film industry is undoubtedly on a path to make a significant mark on the global stage. I'm Abed, and this has been What's Doing. We hope today's episode has given you a deeper understanding of the potential and dynamism of the Malaysian film industry. Until next time, keep stewing.